today we have the prospect and the future of a government in Ontario for the people. The, the people have voted for lower taxes. The people have voted for balanced budgets. The people have voted to open Ontario for business. And the people have voted against the Prime Minister's carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister accept the verdict of the people and cancel his carbon tax plan to raise the price of everything? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Thank Environment. You, Mr. Speaker, I would also like to start by congratulating all those who put their names forward as candidates in the election that occurred last night. Mr. Speaker, the impacts of climate change don't stop with a change in government, and Canadians expect us to take serious action to address climate change and to grow our economy. That is why we are accelerating the phase out of coal, making historic investments in cleaner infrastructure, and putting in place a price on carbon pollution to grow the economy in cleaner ways. The science is clear, climate change is real, and we will continue to deliver on what Canadians and what Ontarians expect. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Kathleen Wynne was this Prime Minister's Liberal soulmate. They agreed on absolutely everything. They both raised taxes. They both ran, ran massive deficits. They both wrap our entrepreneurs in red tape. And they both dance to Gerald Butt's tune. And Mr. Speaker, the agenda of high taxes and big government, of carbon taxes on working people, has been rejected by Ontarians. Will the Prime Minister take that message? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected on a platform of investing in Canadians to grow our economy and to work to protect the environment. Our plan is working. We have successfully developed the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, a historic agreement to address climate change with the provinces and territories. Since we formed government, the Canadian economy has created over 60 per cent more full-time jobs than the Harper Conservatives did over the same time period. And last month, Canada saw its strongest wage growth year over year since 2009. Our government will continue to invest in Canadians as we continue to grow the middle class and support those working hard to join it. The Honourable Member for Carleton. We asked about the Liberal plan to raise the price of gas by at least 11 cents a litre. They said, that's okay. Kathleen Wynne agrees with us. We said the carbon tax will raise the cost of home heating for the average family. They said, that's okay. Kathleen Wynne is on side with our plan. When we said the carbon tax would make groceries more expensive for the average Canadian family, they said, well, we've got Kathleen Wynne in our corner. Yeah. Now, Kathleen Wynne has been rejected by the people of Ontario who have delivered a verdict for the people. Will this government take that message? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians know that climate change is real, and they expect us to take strong action, and that is exactly what we are doing. We have taken action. We're accelerating the phase out of traditional coal power. We're making historic investments in clean infrastructure like public transit, and we are putting in place a price on carbon pollution to grow the economy in cleaner ways. I certainly wish, Mr. Speaker, that for the sake of our children and grandchildren, the Conservatives were not making climate change a partisan argument. We will continue to take practical, cost-effective measures to tackle climate change and grow a clean, a clean growth economy, because, Mr. Speaker, that is what Canadians expect. That is what our children expect. Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Kathleen Wynne, the great friend of the Prime Minister, was right. The Liberal Party lost yesterday. What happened was that Ontarians clearly said that they wanted a conservative progressive government that would abolish the liberal carbon tax, the one that the current government wants to impose. Mr. Speaker, will the government continue with its desire to impose a carbon tax despite the popular will? Mr. Speaker, the impacts of climate change don't stop with a change of government, and Canadians expect us to deal with climate change by taking serious action to improve our economy. This is the reason for which we are uh, reducing the use of fossil fuels, we are investing in green infrastructure, and putting a price on pollution to make the, the economy grow in a green way. Science is clear, climate change is real, and we will continue to meeting Canadians' expectations on this matter. Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. 
Well, according to the government, uh, under the former government, greenhouse gas emissions were reduced by more than 2% without a Liberal carbon tax. Yesterday, Ontarians sent a clear message. They don't want one. So if the Liberal government wants to go forward, despite the popular will, will they at least have the decency to give Canadians the information about how much it will cost for each Canadian family? General Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, as I said, our government was elected on a platform of electing, of investing in our economy and protecting our environment. Our plan is working. Since we formed government, the Canadian economy has created uh, many new jobs, far more than under the Conservatives during the same period of time. Last month, Canada saw its biggest salary increase year over year uh, since April 2009. Our government will continue to invest in Canadians to grow the middle class. Honourable Member for Oshaga. Mr. Speaker, apparently taking $4.5 billion from taxpayers to buy a pipeline is in the national interest. But as uh, Chief Patrick Madaby from the Anishinaabe Nation said, this government is ready to pull out their checkbook for something that won't contribute to a sustainable future. And so they should also be ready to pay a big amount of money for women's rights, the health system, indigenous rights, or child welfare. Mr. Speaker, what are the Liberals' real priorities? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Mr. President, notre... Mr. Speaker, our government came to an agreement with Kinder Morgan to ensure that the pipeline would be built. We will guarantee over five uh, 15,000 jobs, uh, including 9,000 in BC, during the construction period. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, this investment is a fair price for can uh, Canadians. We are able to undertake this project because we know that uh, th we are respecting the trust that Canadians placed in us when it comes to growing the economy and protecting the environment. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Didn't vote to buy a pipeline. Yesterday, the Grand Council Chief from the Anishinaabeg Nation called the Liberals' decision to spend $4.5 billion on a leaky 65-year-old pipeline very foolish. He asked this, why is the government paying an international company when there are so many needs in this country it's a good question. Think about how many communities across Canada, particularly Indigenous ones, could benefit from this level of investment. So my question, if the Liberals were to invest these billions of dollars in clean energy, would we create more or less jobs in this pipeline? Have they even... The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The NDP can't seem to decide if they're a party that supports responsible resource development or if they're still the party of the Leap Manifesto. Let's be clear. The NDP will not support any project, even to the point of having their MPs disrespect the rule of law. The member opposite fails to acknowledge there are several Indigenous communities along the route who support this project. Can he please tell this House, are their interests also not important? This project was subject to the most exhaustive consultation in the history of pipelines in Canada. I wonder if the member opposite has bothered to consult the dozens of First Nations communities that stand to benefit from this project moving forward. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Divide and conquer, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of jobs, tons of th tens of thousands of Canadian jobs are under attack by the actions of President Trump. Millions more are worried about how a trade war will impact their families and their communities. No one can predict what President Trump will do next. So instead, will the government focus on protecting workers here at home? Can the government tell us exactly when meetings will take place with labour and industry to determine precisely how we can support our Canadian workers? Hello. The, honour... the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we have committed to supporting our aluminum and steel industries uh, in because the, that have been negatively affected by this, this frankly, illegal and, and absurd tariff, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we will continue to do so. We are in meetings with those industries. Uh, we have continued to support innovation in steel-related research. We have invested recently $60 million in Rio Tinto and Alcoa in the Saguenay region to make 
greener and cleaner aluminum, Mr. Speaker. So we are continuing to support those industries moving forward, and we will continue to support those industries in the, in the face of the Deputy de saint General Member for Santa Santa Bayouds. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister told farmers that there would be no NAFTA without supply management. The response from farmers in Saguenay was, we would have liked to have heard the words fully maintained. For 20 years, the government has been giving access to Canadian markets at each negotiation. The government doesn't seem able to say those words. The Prime Minister would rather talk about flexibility. Furthermore, this morning on Twitter, President Trump directly attacked supply management. What is this government going to do to protect our supply management system against unfair American attacks? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, our government is firmly in support of supply management and has committed to maintaining it. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Agriculture, as well as the Ministers of uh, Foreign Affairs and other Cabinet Ministers, and all of the Quebec Liberal members, have been very clear. They have said unequivocally that NAFTA nego negotiations uh, are, will be clearly in support of supply management. Our government supports the system and will continue to defend and protect it, as well as the interests of fa farming families. The Honourable Member for Haldeman, Norfolk. Well, Mr. Speaker, yesterday Ontarians ended 15 years of Liberal wasteful spending and overtaxation here, here. Right. by electing a Conservative majority government here, here. with a clear mandate to lower taxes and fight the Liberals' tax grab that they call a carbon tax. The people of Ontario have spoken loud and clear, but will the Prime Minister start listening to Canadians and stop forcing his carbon tax on everyday Canadians? Or will he, at the very least, tell them how much it will cost them? Here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the four provinces that price carbon pollution in Canada, B.C., Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec led the country in growth last year, Mr. Speaker. The environment and the economy go together. British Columbia put a price on carbon pollution more than a decade ago, and since 2008, British Columbia's direct price on carbon has reduced emissions by between 5 and 15 percent, according to the experts at the University of Ottawa and Duke University. While provincial GDP grew more than 17 percent during that period, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, it shows that the price on carbon pollution, as part of an overall plan to address climate change, will address it will create economic growth. The Honourable Member for Barrie Innisville. I want to change his talking points. The Prime Minister and Kathleen Wynne were political BFFs who share the same rigid ideology. Last night, voters in Ontario sent a clear message that they'd had enough of Liberal taxes, scandal, entitlement, debt and deficits, and Liberal corruption. In fact, the same backroom operatives that ran Ontario into the ground are the same ones running the Prime Minister's office. The people of Ontario rejected the failed policies developed by Gerald Butts. Will the Prime Minister listen to the people of Ontario and not Gerald Butts and scrap this carbon tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, as long as we're talking about taxes, let's get the facts straight. Uh, our government has cut taxes for 9 million middle-class Canadians while raising them on the richest 1 per cent. We've also helped hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty, Mr. Speaker, with our, child, uh, our Canada Child Benefit that benefits 9 out of 10 Canadian families. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. It is the right plan, and that plan is working. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by thanking and welcoming my MPP, Jeff York, on his re-election. It's been yeah. fantastic. But last night, we saw the people of Elgin, Middlesex, London send a clear message by rejecting this carbon tax. The Liberals have lost over half of their so-called provincial support for the carbon tax. The Environment Minister has to realize that people aren't buying into, this, into these talking points. Ontario will join Saskatchewan and soon we'll see Alberta opposing these job-killing carbon taxes. Now that Ontario has spoken loud and clear, when will the Prime Minister scrap his carbon tax? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians know that we can fight climate change and grow the economy at the same time. As many of Canada's largest employers have pointed out, putting a price on carbon pollution is just good business. It's already helping to build a clean growth economy and to make Canadian businesses more innovative and more competitive. Businesses like New Flyer, who make zero emission buses in Winnipeg, Landmark Homes, who make energy efficient homes for Edmonton families. They know that pricing pollution encourages innovation and will bring good new middle class jobs for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker. 
There are blue skies over Sarnia-Lambton today and blue skies over Ontario, thanks to a Conservative majority. Mr. Speaker, this province has spoken out against the carbon tax. With multiple provinces in agreement, the carbon tax will hurt Canadians, hurt our businesses, do nothing for the planet. Will the Prime Minister abandon this ill-conceived plan or be transparent enough to let Canadians know how much he'll force us to pay? Well done. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister Thank you, Mr. Of Speaker. The Conservatives don't have a plan to address climate change. They don't even seem to believe that climate change is real or that it's a problem. And they are missing the boat on the enormous opportunities that will be enabled through addressing climate change in thoughtful and substantive ways. The World Bank the Par has, has indicated that the Paris Agreement will create $23 trillion in economic opportunities going forward. You know, Mr. Speaker, when they were in power, the Canada's share of, of the global clean tech market shrunk by half. It was a function of the fact that they did nothing to address climate change. This government is going to grow the economy and address climate change at the same time. The Honourable Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, Ontario voters have spoken clearly. They do not want a carbon tax. Now it's time for the Prime Minister to stop forcing his punishing carbon tax on middle-class Canadian families. Farmers in Kitchener-Conestoga are especially concerned about this unfair tax, which increases their costs for tractor fuel, fertilizer, transportation of feed, and farm products. Will the Prime Minister finally stop forcing and using his heavy-handed taxes, which are only needed because of his out-of-control spending? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, a comprehensive approach to addressing climate change includes regulatory measures like phasing out of coal, like reducing methane emissions. It includes investments in clean technology and green infrastructure, and it also includes a price on carbon. A recent study released showed that by 2030, a price on carbon will reduce 80 to 90 megatons of carbon emissions while stimulating economic growth going forward. The, the Conservatives have not told us how they will actually address climate change because many of them over there don't even believe in climate science. It's time for us to actually hear from the opposition about how they will actually put together a plan to address climate change. Honourable Member for Peace River Westlock. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the voters of Ontario sent a clear message to this Prime Minister. They don't want his carbon tax. Here, here, Last here. year, Saskatchewan rejected the Liberal carbon tax, and next year, when Alberta elects Jason Kenney as Premier, Albertans will reject this terrible tax. The Prime Minister has to for stop forcing his carbon tax on Canadian families. When will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and abandon his terrible carbon tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Conservative Party likes to repeat the question over and over again, and I will repeat the similar answer, which is a thoughtful approach to addressing climate change includes measures that are regulatory measures, it includes making significant investments, and it includes putting a price on pollution to incent efficiency, to grow the economy, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, we have a comprehensive plan. Canadians want us to address climate change in a thoughtful way. They want us to ensure we're protecting the future for our children and our grandchildren. That's exactly what we are going to do. And the question that they have for the Leader of the Opposition is, where is your climate plan? The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, today is World Oceans Day and Canadians are concerned about the health of our coastal waters. But instead of investing in clean, renewable energy, the Liberals have just spent $4.5 billion, our dollars, on an outdated pipeline that threatens our waterways while doing nothing to address the catastrophic consequences of a bitumen spill. And when it comes to an oil spill, the question is not if, but when. So why is this government forcing this pipeline through when they have no way for protecting our waters? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Speaker, the NDP indeed applauded Premier Notley's plan to protect the environment, but it seems they forgot what that plan contained. Let me remind them. A cap on oil sands emissions, a price on pollution, a pipeline to get resources to markets other than the United States. That is what is real leadership on climate change looks like, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we're putting a price on pollution phasing out coal, and are investing in clean technologies. Progressive leaders like Premier Notley get it, and it's unfortunate that the federal NDP disagrees with her. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Oswego. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister likes to strut around the international stage bragging about being a great champion of the environment. 
He's lucky that not everyone reads the Canadian papers, because they would quickly realize that instead of doing what he says, he took four and a half billion dollars of public money to buy a pipeline. The Liberals had promised to be champions of renewable energy. Why are they breaking their promise? Why are they investing in the energies of the past rather than the energies of the future? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question, which allows me to talk about some of the work that we are doing around protecting our environment and growing the economy, including a $1.5 billion oceans protections plan. And it's simply not the case that that um, one can. Let me rephrase that: that we believe that one can't be done with the other. That's why, in um, in addition to putting a price on pollution, we have a climate change policy that addresses all of the opportunities within the clean tech sector, whether that is in nuclear, whether that is in bioenergy, whether that is in oil and gas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, whether the Prime Minister and his Environment Minister want to accept it or not, last night Ontarians overwhelmingly rejected their carbon tax. My home province of Saskatchewan welcomes a new ally in the fight against this Liberal tax grab. Will the Prime Minister learn from the lesson that has befallen his friend, the former Premier Kathleen Wynne, and finally stop forcing his carbon tax on middle-class Canadians all across this country? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. As I've said, Canadians know that we can flight, uh, fight climate change and grow our economy at the same time. Many of Canada's largest employers have endorsed the concept of a price on carbon pollution. It's already helping to build a clean growth economy, economy for Canada. Companies like Carbon Cure in Nova Scotia, companies like Hydrogenics in Toronto, companies like uh, General Fusion or, or uh, Carbon Engineering in British Columbia. These are companies that are part of the wave of clean growth that will enable Canada to ensure that economic growth continues going forward while we meet our international obligations to address climate change. Well, member for Yorkton, Melville. Mr. Speaker, it's a beautiful sunny day in Canada today. Why? Because last night Ontarians made the right choice for a new beginning in their province. Our Conservative Saskatchewan members of Parliament welcome the new Ontario Progressive Conservative Government as an ally with our Premier and with the wonderful people of Saskatchewan in rejecting this Liberal government's carbon tax. Will the Prime Minister now finally listen to middle class families and scrap his carbon tax? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians want their government to address the climate issue in thoughtful ways. They want to ensure that we are addressing and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in accordance with our international commitments, and they want us to do that in ways that ensure that we grow an economy that will ensure prosperity for Canadians in the future. Mr. Mr. Speaker, that is what the pan-Canadian framework is about, that we negotiated with the provinces and territories. It's a comprehensive approach that will drive growth going forward and will allow us to address climate change. I just want to remind the honourable members the rules again. I know we've heard them before, but when somebody's speaking, it's not polite or it's against the rules to actually shout at them. So I'd like to hear what the honourable question is or the honourable answer is. The honourable member for Rasuris, Moose Mountain. Mr. Speaker, last night Ontarians rejected the Liberal carbon tax in their election of a progressive Conservative government. They will join my province of Saskatchewan and soon Alberta in rejecting the Liberals and their carbon tax. We in Saskatchewan know this plight all too well. We welcome our new ally in the fight against the Prime Minister's job-killing carbon tax. When will the Prime Minister stop his attack on middle-class families and axe his carbon tax? Yeah. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said on a number of occasions, Canadians expect their government to address climate change in thoughtful and substantive ways. That means ensuring that we have a comprehensive plan, one that addresses regulatory issues such as uh, accelerating the phase out of coal, reducing methane emissions, making major investments in green infrastructure and, and investments to stimulate the growth of clean technology in this country. And it also includes putting a price on pollution to ensure that we're trying to address what we don't want and, and accelerating the innovation that we do. We are focused on ensuring a balanced approach that will drive economic growth going forward, but will also enable us to reduce greenhouse. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Bidnapur. 
Mr. Speaker, yesterday voters in Ontario made it clear they are fed up with rising taxes, including the Liberals' carbon tax. And we also can be sure Alberta will send the same message next year when voters elect Jason Kenney here, here. Premier. Here, here. When will this Prime Minister start listening and stop forcing his unaffordable, job-killing carbon tax here. on hard-working, middle-class Canadians? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Climate change is real. Climate change requires that we actually come up with thoughtful and substantive ways to address the issue. It involves thinking about the economy of the future, driving innovation. It looks at the key measures, and the most significant and, and cost-effective measures to actually reduce that. One of those is putting a price on carbon pollution. I know on that side of the House that they were not in, they were not in favour of, of learning uh, based on data and science over the past 10 years when they were in government, but, that, but the price on carbon pollution has been demonstrated internationally as one of the most effective and low-cost ways to address the carbon issue. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Mr. Speaker, today is June 8, only three short weeks away from the Liberals' declared July 1 deadline for cannabis legalization. Talk about a plan going up in smoke. Now we have a slew of amendments to the Liberals' bill from the unelected Senate that this House will now need to deal with. After three years of waiting, Canadians want legalization, clarity and reasonable rules for everyone. What is this government's plan to deal with these amendments so that Canadians get what they deserve, a fair and timely cannabis law? The Honourable Parliamentary, or sorry, the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, with respect to Bill C-45, the cannabis legislation that we're moving forward, I would like to thank the members in the other House for their thoughtful and considered uh, amendments that they've put forward. I'm, I'm anticipating that we will see, receive a message in this House. We will carefully consider the amendments that the uh, other House has put forward as we move towards a comprehensive legalized framework and strict regulation of cannabis. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After yesterday's Senate vote on the cannabis bill, the bill has now been, will be sent back to the House with amendments numbering in the 40s. With this slowdown, and with every other slowdown, and the imminent date for legalization of cannabis, there are thousands of Canadians who are living with criminal charges, and they're already marginalized. Why are the Liberals letting down Canadian citizens? Decriminalization has to happen now. The Honourable Minister of Health, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the current approach for cannabis does not work. It has put money in the hands of criminals. We need to keep it out of the hands of children. The government is legalizing and strictly regulating access to cannabis, and we are pleased that Bill C-45 was passed by the Senate. We thank them for their work, and the government will take a very close look at the amendments that have been brought forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Mr. Speaker, on April 22nd, we celebrated Earth Day. On that day, Canada joined the international community to underscore the importance of protecting our environment, and there were many cleanup activities that took place throughout the country. Single-use plastics that are thrown out after use is a huge waste of resources and energy, and this waste is a threat to our marine zones. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Environment and the Climate Change tell this House about the latest measures that have been taken to target plastic waste? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. See, uh... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I would like to thank my colleague, the member for Pontiac, for his question and all his good work. Our government is determined to protect our environment and to preserve our waterways for all Canadians and so that they can all continue to benefit from them. That is why Canada will be taking steps this year under its uh, presidency of the G7 and in years to come in order to make sure that plastic does not end up in our oceans, our waterways and our landfills. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Méganticlera. Mr. Speaker, dairy producers are right to no longer believe the Prime Minister. Real Agriculture has just told us that the American Secretary for Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, confirmed the Prime Minister's hypocrisy. You just said 
Le premier ministre a été mal... The Prime Minister was dishonest yesterday with the Saguenay producers. Why did he hide the fact that Canada has already offered the Americans concessions? Will the Prime Minister and his ministers finally tell us all the truth? What concessions did they make? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, our government supports producers and supply management. We are the party that fought to implement the system, and we will continue to protect it and defend it. We have always said and repeated that it is an excellent system. Mr. Speaker, the, do the Harper Conservators want us just to sign any old agreement? This government will only sign an agreement that is good for all Canadians. We continue to support supply management producers, their families, and all our agricultural interests. The Honourable Minister for Mégantic L'Érable. Oh, well, they're so good at playing with words, aren't they, Mr. Speaker? But we have a question. Which Prime Minister should we be leaving? The one saying no in Chicoutimi or the one saying yes to the United States? Mathieu Frigon, a producer, was right to be extremely disappointed by the PM's visit to Saguenay yesterday. The news is always coming from the States. Canada made an offer to the Americans, and that was confirmed by the American Secretary for Agriculture. So I'm asking once again, what is that offer? Why lie to dairy producers in Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Mr. Speaker, our government supports supply management and all its families. This is a source of stability, stability for everyone. We are the party that implemented it, and we will continue to defend it. We said over and over again that supply management proposals from our American partners are unacceptable. We will continue to protect supply management producers, their families, and all agricultural interests. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lévis-Lodbinière. Mr. Speaker, because of the PM's tweets, our country has become a veritable sieve for illegal immigration. And now the extent of the problem is there for our leader to see. From January to April alone, there were 9,600 15 illegal entries in Quebec. And imagine, now our border agents are expecting up to 400 illegal arrivers per day this summer. That is scandalous. Mr. Speaker, why did the Prime Minister refuse to include the issue of illegal immigrants on the G7 agenda? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm certain that the uh, leader's visit to La Colle will be very, interest very interesting. The former government cut funds. And that's what the leader of the opposition will probably learn when he visits there. They also made cruel and unfair cuts to immigration. Mr. Speaker, we need to regulate our arrivals. And uh, I would actually just send the opposition leader back home when he goes to visit La Colle. The Honourable Member for Cartier. Mr. Speaker. One month ago, I asked the Minister of Public Safety what the lives of correctional officers were worth. In Donnacona, there are men and women who are risking their lives every day while the government simply nickels and dimes. Rather than look for Phoenix Pay system, the government is cutting the internal firefighting service in prisons. Will the Liberals act and protect our workers and adequately pay our professional public servants? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. We are absolutely committed to maintaining a safe and respectful work environment for all members of, of the, the, our public safety. We have, are working closely with the new Interim Commissioner on Correctional Services who is taking significant measures uh, to in ensure a safe and healthy workplace for all corrections workers in this country. The Honourable Member for Laurier-Saint-Marie. Mr. Speaker, the repression of women's rights advocates in Saudi Arabia is increasing. Many have been arrested, detained, and accused of crimes such as suspicious contacts with foreign parties or undermining state security and stability, including a former student of the University of British Columbia, Lujain Al-Atloul. What has the government done? 
to ask that all these advocates for women be able to work safely in Saudi Arabia. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This government will always defend human rights, including the rights of women and girls abroad. We are extremely disappointed by the arrests of these advocates in Saudi Arabia. These arrests are completely incompatible with the Saudi government's commitment to creating a more tolerant and open society. And the minister has raised her concerns with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Saudi Arabia. We will always, as I have just said, promote and defend the rights of women and girls and human rights here in Canada and abroad. Kootenai, Colombia. The Liberal government is spending $4.5 billion of taxpayer money, that's our money, to buy a 65-year-old leaky pipeline. Many Canadians don't realize that that pipeline runs through Jasper National Park and BC's Mount Robson Provincial Park. The government claims it will prioritize ecological integrity, but environmental leaders don't ram new pipelines through national and provincial parks. Can the minister explain how buying and expanding a pipeline will protect the ecological integrity of Jasper National Park. Well, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Trans Mountain Project, which will provide significant economic benefits to all Canadians, was approved by the federal government and by the province of BC and by the province of Alberta after a thorough review of all key environmental issues. The decision includes 157 conditions associated with the construction of the pipeline. It includes incorporating the emissions in the Pan-Canadian framework. It includes an oceans protection plan. It includes a range of measures to ensure that the pipeline construction is done safely and in accordance with the ecological integrity of Canada's national parks. It is a decision that was taken after a review and addressing all of the key environmental concerns, and it is a project that is in the national interest. Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, a year ago, BC suffered the worst wildfires in our history. The government said it would be there for us, but it didn't last much past the photo op. We brought to the finance minister's attention a very important issue around salvage woods and capital gains treatment. Local government brought the same issue to him. Six months, phone calls, letters, not even the courtesy of a response in terms of this issue. Can the finance minister stand up and tell us and tell the victims what he's going to do in terms of at least responding to a very simple request for uh, options. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, Public Safety Canada is mandated to keep Canadians safe from a wide range of natural disasters, including, of course, wildfires. The Government Operations Centre, acting on behalf of the Government of Canada, provides response coordination in such events affecting their national interest, and our government will always stand ready to help any province or territory that requests federal assistance to respond to any natural disaster, including wildland urban interface fires. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, here's another victim of the Liberal summer jobs attestation requirements. One of Nova Scotia's must-see attractions, the Bangor Sawmill Museum, has had to close its doors. This has been a staple of the community since before Confederation. The member for West Nova has been shamefully silent while the landmark and the jobs that go with it are lost. How can the Liberals not see the absurdity of their Orwellian policy and the impact it's having on communities across the country? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. I'd like to thank her for her newfound interest in uh, jobs for young Canadians. Yeah. She should talk to maybe her seatmate because when the member from Carleton was uh, minister, he cut $20 million oh, out of the youth yeah. employment strategy. Yes, of course, his boss, the former, you know, Stephen Harper, he wanted to shut the program down completely. So we'll take no lessons from the Conservatives about what to do for young Canadians. In Nova Scotia, we've got over 3,000 young students that are going to benefit from the, the, the investment made by this government, twice as much as the Conservatives made. Honourable member for Edmonton West. On Wednesday, the Prime Minister stood in this House and bragged about killing jobs in Alberta by cancelling oil and gas exploration tax credits. Mr. Speaker, thousands of Albertans rely on jobs in our oil and gas industry. Can the Minister of Infrastructure stand and tell us if he and the member from Edmonton Centre support this job-killing decision? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Infrastructure. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand here on this side of the House and, and, and support Albertans and the jobs that we're creating in Alberta. Uh, let me underline what we've done for Alberta. Working with our Alberta partners, we've improved transit roads, bridges and water systems all over Alberta. We have approved 150 projects worth $1.7 billion in federal funding, Mr. Speaker, and that's $3.9 billion in, federal fu in funding in, in totality. I, on the, I, with the Minister of Infrastructure, are quite proud to stand on this side of the House and do more in three years than several dozen MPs from Alberta did in ten years for Alberta, yeah, 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 yeah. and we'll do it again when we get re-elected, Mr. The Honourable Member for Bonavista Buren Trinity. Mr. Speaker, the OSHA's Protection Plan is an important priority for our government, as well as for the people in my riding of Bonavista Buren Trinity. What, what, one moment. I'm trying to hear the Honourable Member for uh, Bonavista Buren Trinity, and I have a hard time, and he's not far from me, so I just want everybody to listen to his question. I'm sure it's a good one. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, the OSHA's Protection Plan is an important priority for our government, as well as for the people in my riding of Bonavista Buren Trinity. We know that we must do everything we can to ensure that our waterways and coasts are protected and preserved for generations to come. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister share with this House the details of new initiatives taken to help the Canadian Coast Guard in contributing to protection and strengthening marine safety across the region? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, on this World's Ocean Day, I want to thank the member from Bonavista to Beer and Trinity for his advocacy on this issue and on the Fisheries Committee. Last month, we announced the official reopening of the Canadian Coast Guard's Maritime Rescue Subcenter in St. John's. The centre coordinates the Coast Guard's on-the-water response to marine incidents in the area and provides an essential link for mariners operating in the unique and challenging conditions often experienced off the coastlines of Newfoundland and Labrador. The centre will have a staff of 12 maritime search and rescue coordinators and demonstrates our continued commitment to the Canadian Coast Guard and our coastal communities. Well the Honourable Member for Flamborough, Glenbrook. Speaker, Iran's Khomeini regime regularly uses terror groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah to destabilize the Middle East and target Israel, our closest ally and the only stable democracy in region. This week, Iran's so-called supreme leader tweeted that Israel is a malignant, cancerous tumor that has to be removed and eradicated. And his ambassador to France revealed that they're funding the present violent protests in Gaza. Why do the Liberals continue to insist on normalizing relations with a country that's such an obvious threat to peace, security, and democracy? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government and I believe all Canadians are appalled by the abhorred statement from Supreme Leader Khomeini. Our position on Iran is clear. We oppose Iran's support for terrorist organizations. We oppose its threats towards Israel. We oppose its ballistic missile program and its support for the murderous Assad regime in Syria. Canada has been for many years and continues to be a steadfast friend of Israel, and we will continue to support Israel's right to live in peace. Thank you. Honourable Member for Bay of Quinte. Mr. Speaker, we know that residential schools were instrumental in stripping away the language and culture of Indigenous peoples. This is one of the tragic legacies of the residential school system. As our government continues to work in partnership with Indigenous communities on a journey towards reconciliation, can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage please update this House on the work being done to fulfil the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to Action 13, 14, and 15 concerning Indigenous languages? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague from the Bay of Kinty for his engagement in this issue. We've said it many times, there is no relationship more important to our government than our relationship with Indigenous peoples. And we know that Indigenous languages are endangered across this country. That's why we're working with Métis, Inuit and First Nations leaders to co-develop the First Indigenous Languages Act and why we've recently announced the next phase of our engagement on this issue. Furthermore, we've invested an historic $90 million for Indigenous languages initiatives. This is an essential step in our journey towards reconciliation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, the courts awarded Mr. and Mrs. Samaru of Nanaimo $1.7 million in damages for malicious prosecution by the Canada Revenue Agency. This malicious prosecution ruined this family's life and cost taxpayers nearly $3 million in damages and legal cost. The minister has refused to confirm whether or not the individuals singled out by the judge are still employed at the CRA. Is this the minister's idea 
of being more client focused at the Canada Revenue Agency. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Revenue. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to ensuring the agency treats Canadians as valued clients and not simply as taxpayers. The confidence and trust that, trust that individuals have in the agency is the cornerstone of our tax system. The agency's employee involved in the audit follows rigorous training. Behaviors that diverge from their code of contact is not tolerated. I'd, rem I'd remind my honourable colleague that this case dates 2008 under the previous Conservative government. And as this matter is before the court, it would be inappropriate for me to comment any further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, yesterday in La Baie, 150 dairy producers called on the Prime Minister to protect supply management in its entirety in NAFTA. These are the same producers who were promised at the time of the Lac Saint-Jean election that the TPP would not be opened up at all, and then exactly the opposite happened three months later. Well, this time they didn't let him trot out his speaking points. They insisted on zero concessions, and the Prime Minister answered, I hear you, I understand your concerns. When a politician says that, you know you're in trouble. Will the government protect supply management in its entirety? That's not complicated. In its entirety, yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, we are the ones who implemented supply management and we will always defend it. Mr. Speaker, who is it who wants to end supply management? The member for La Beauce. Their uh, leader. Uh, the member for Lévis Lotbinière. And many other Conservative members. On this side, all Liberals, all Quebec Liberals supply, support supply management. The Honourable Member for Maniquagan. Mr. Speaker, the G7 is a gathering of the world's most powerful, but it's also a time when many damages occur, whether it be in Quebec City, Puerto Pique, it's municipalities, businesses and people who pay the price of this show. I'm thinking of the tourism industry, for example, which is so important to our national capital region and the area of Charlevoix. I'm worried about all those business owners who will see their revenues drop and their windows broken. I'm worried about seasonal workers who will have to stay at home just when the summer season is beginning. The G7 indulgences are in huge contrast to the losses of those left out. Will the government commit to fully compensating, compensating those who are going to suffer the consequences? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Mr. Speaker, we are very proud to host the world leaders to the beautiful area of Charlevoix for this G7 meeting today and tomorrow. The Prime Minister has met leaders from the area, the Mayor, as well as many businesses that might be affected by this meeting. We know that the Charlevoix residents they, uh, themselves are proud to host this meeting. And I must tell my colleague that the policies in place for compensation for local businesses that are affected are the same policies that were in place when the Conservatives were hosting this event. The Honourable Member for Maniquaga. Mr. Speaker, the only contact the people of La Romaine and Unamenchipu have with the mainland is the Bella de Gagné ship. Yet for years, the government has known that the La Romaine Wharf is in a critical strait, so critical state rather, so critical that the boat could only land a quarter of its load yesterday. These were mostly perishable items. Time is going by, Mr. Speaker, and this is about the safety of the people in La Romaine and Unamenchipu. Will the Minister of Transport take action and what does he plan for the people of the basque -Côte nord The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transport. Thank you, and I'd like to thank my colleague. The citizens of La Romaine and the Lower North Shore are our priority. The Minister's office is in contact with the office of the local member, and we will remain in contact on this file. We want to make sure that all necessary work will be done as quickly as possible in order to resolve this situation. Thank you. That brings question period to an end. Um, uh, tabling of documents. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Pursuant to standing.